All right. Can you guys see my main presentation again? Looks good. All right. Thanks again. Okay. So now um, let me check if there's some questions and we'll move on to uh, talk about some tumors here. All right. So what are some ways to differentiate a new tumor enhancement and radiation necrosis post resection with radiation? Yeah. So that, that's, um, you know, something people are actively working on. There are some more advanced sequences such as perfusion imaging where, um, you know, changes in perfusion can help to differentiate these. Um, some of the work that I did in the past was trying to use machine learning tools to try to differentiate this, but there's not a great um, method to do it with certainty. Many times what ends up happening is if it's a GBM, for instance, and there's new enhancement, if the patient's doing well and there's not a lot of mass effect, we usually don't rush in to take, this, to take that lesion out. Sometimes for clinical trials, it will, will require a biopsy of the material to see if it's um, more consistent with tumor versus radiation. Uh, but those are, you know, kind of the, the clinical way it plays out. Um, you know, pseudo progression is something else to think about. It's basically where patients are treated, but then they develop new contrast enhancement in the cavity. Or the patient I'm following with the same thing. And, um, you know, he's doing very well clinically, so we're just following him with surveillance imaging, you know, every two to four months. But that's a great question and things people are actively working on. Uh, do you ever find neurocystricosis, lymphoma, or toxo to also have ring enhancement? Absolutely. So lymphoma, toxo, these are all um, ring enhancing lesions. For toxo, it's usually multiple. And there are some blood tests that you could send for toxo. For lymphoma, um, you could have ophthalmology do a slit lamp experiment. You could do lumbar punctures to send for cytology. So these are some adjuncts. If all of those fail, a biopsy is usually indicated. Or in the case we start for neurocystic psychosis, you could do a resection potentially. Okay, so in a patient in an ongoing um, radiation therapy for GBM, how do you differentiate lesion is improving or the radiation causes further damage? Yeah, so that's, that's again, um, one of the things we, we mentioned. Um, it's, it's very hard to know. So short answer is there are some adjuncts, but you end up just following the patient clinically. And if whatever it is, if it's tumor recurrence or if it's radiation necrosis, if it's exerting mass effect, you may consider going into resected. Okay, could you please show tumor factive MS and how to differentiate it from GBM? Uh, you know, it's, I, I'd say there's not a great way. Um, let me see, I think I had one tumor factive. Uh, yeah, so you could argue tumor factive MS is here. Not a great way. Um, for MS, you could do other tests um, visual evoke potentials, sending off CSF. So there's a few adjuncts. And again, you know, a lot of these ring enhancing lesions look the same. It's going to depend a lot on the clinical history and other testing to differentiate them. And ultimately, sometimes pathology. You know, there have been cases where, you know, we don't think it's lymphoma, we get in there, it is lymphoma, and we simply stop, which is important because lymphoma is usually very treatable um, you know, by medicine or radiation. Okay, and then in terms of MRI ring enhancing lesions, how can you differentiate an infarct from a ring lesion of a cortical venous thrombosis? Uh, so that's an interesting question. So I think for subacute bleeds, I'm sorry, subacute infarcts, um, you see ring enhancement. Usually cortical venous thrombosis, you will see um, more of a, a territory that is affected and sometimes there could be blood products inside that. Basically in venous thrombosis, the, there's venous hypertension such that there could be bleeds that occur under pressure. So that's probably how I would indirectly do it. But again, not a, not a clear cut differentiation. Okay, let's jump ahead a little bit. So um, really another key thing is extraaxial versus intraaxial. So is the tumor coming from the outside pushing in on the brain? or is it starting from the brain itself? That could also change your operative approach in many cases. If it's extra axial, like large meningioma, I usually will do a much larger craniotomy or opening in order to um, really be able to get around it. If it's something deep in the brain, of course you have to think about what part of the brain you're in, but sometimes you know once you're in, you can kind of suction and work inside the lesion. You don't need such a, such a large opening. So a very good distinction. This applies for when you're looking at pictures of spinal cord tumors and, and elsewhere. Okay, so this lesion, a little hard to say just on these pictures alone, but this is an extra axial lesion. This is a meningioma. 
So this arises from the coverings or the meninges of the brain. It pushes onto the brain, uh, but does not usually invade it. Um, sometimes if you notice T2 signal or edema, that suggests that you know, there are tumor cells that are invading the brain or affecting it. And this patient underwent, a, uh, I believe, a bicoronal incision to remove this lesion. Um, this is, a, this is a, a specific type of meningioma that we call uh, parafalci. And these can be interesting because it's very important to, to figure out their relationship with the, sag the superior sagittal sinus. So depending on several factors like the patient's age, you may resect this lesion, but at the time of surgery, see if it's invading the sagittal sinus, you may choose to actually leave some of that tissue and later can follow this um, with imaging depending on its, um, its grade and potentially do radiation therapy. Um, if someone were to ask you what part of the sinus is safer to sacrifice if you had to, is it the anterior third, the middle third, or the posterior third? My answer would be it's safer to sacrifice the anterior third. So that's something that you may be asked in the future. Okay, this um, lesion is a little bit different. This is an intraaxial lesion. And when we give contrast, which you can tell it's lighting up here in the sinus, this tumor does not light up. So this is what we would call a low-grade tumor. However, it is seen very clearly on a flare image. Here's a pretty sizable uh, tumor here. It's contrast enhancing. Uh, this was taken out through a right frontal approach. And you can see it originated from the ventricle. Um, most high-grade, uh, like things like glioblastoma, Many people have traced um, to having origins in the ventricle. It's thought that there are some um, stem cells that are in that area potentially that can give rise to these tumors. Um, so this, again, just showing here how contrast enhancement usually suggests a more virulent or higher grade tumor. This actually turned out to be a, a very unusual tumor called an ATRT, a typical teratoid rhabdoid tumor. This was in a 23 year old male Usually you see them more commonly in young children, but, but a very, very aggressive lesion. Uh, this patient, unfortunately, despite a, a good resection, passed away um, a few months later from recurrence of this lesion. Okay, here's a few more pictures. Um, this is a patient, um, I believe in his 70s, who presented with um, speech issues. So you can see this is located on the left side. A little hard to tell just from these axial images, but very close to his language areas. Um, you can see it has some, on the head CT, what we've learned, you know, a little bit bright areas, so blood products. Contrast enhancement on the MRI, you see the sagittal sinus lighting up. It's got edema around it, and it's effacing the ventricle. So this was a case of, uh, we did a resection, removed the lesion, case of metastatic melanoma. Melanoma is one that's known to um, be a little more hemorrhagic among the types of lesions that, that metastasize. Other very common metastases, uh, just one based on numbers, is lung. So lung mets are most common. Breast, melanoma, um, GI. I'd say those are, are some very common ones. Um, I'd like to show a few examples of different pathologies based on location. So one location is the cerebellopontine angle. So we have your cerebellum, the pons. It's kind of the angle that it makes. And there's a lot of different uh, pathologies here. One is a schwannoma, which is a, um, you know, along the vestibular nerve, most commonly, cranial nerve eight. People refer to that as an acoustic neuroma. Those patients usually present with a combination of vertigo, hearing loss, and tinnitus. So you can see this lesion is um, right in the CP angle, tracking out along the nerve. Reasons for surgery would be if they're compressing on the brainstem as they grow. Uh, another example, more commonly than aneurysm, is an arachnoid cyst, a meningioma, and an epidermoid. I'd say those four are um, very common in this area. Some other hints, and then they give this mnemonic here, same. Some other hints, um, meningiomas will uh, grow in a way that will narrow the um, internal auditory canal, whereas schwannomas will um, actually sculpt out and expand the opening and, and sculpt out the bone further. Meningiomas, I'll show another example where they have a dural tail. They originate from the covering on the brain, 
and therefore you can see a dural tail. Epidermoids uh, show diffusion restriction, so that's a very nice way. If you look at that sequence, there's restriction, that's a good way of telling you what tumor you're dealing with. Here's some other examples, acoustic neuroma or what we call a vestibular schwannoma. Here's a dural tail suggesting more meningioma. These arrows show some other examples of dural tails here. Here's an example of diffusion restriction. You can see this bright area suggesting an epidermoid. So again, the combination of different sequences and just knowledge of some of these, these features can be very helpful. Um, intraventricular tumors are another class of lesions um, go over based on location. This is a choroid plexus, probably a choroid plexus papilloma. These can be very um, bloody cases and usually you have to find really a main feeding vessel to really get control of this. These are very commonly associated with hydrocephalus. Some people think it's because the tumor produces fluid. Other times it could be obstructing the normal flow of fluid. This is a lesion. Um, the pathology came back as a central neurocytoma. There are other similarly shaped lesions um, such as subependymal nodules or subependymal giant cell astrocytomas, SAGAs. Um, so really a host of lesions that are found in the ventricle. Sometimes with very large ventricles and smaller lesions than this, you could approach them endoscopically, meaning coming with a camera through the CSF and ventricle. Other times, um, you cannot. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna have to just pause just for one moment, if that's all right. Hello? Uh, it is, I'm just um, in the presentation. Can I call back shortly? Thanks so much. Okay, I'm sorry guys. Um, so now we're gonna take a look at the posterior fossa. So the differential diagnosis here um, varies based on the age of the patient. So for adults, by far the most common lesion is a metastatic lesion. So really the top three things in your diagnosis should be metastasis for anyone who comes in an adult with a posterior fossa lesion like this. Um, this was a gentleman, very heavy smoker, um, in his 50s, I believe, who came in with balance issues. And you can imagine with compression of this fourth ventricle, you know, his, his developed hydrocephalus. Also um, in coordination, which, um, you know, makes sense that this affects the cerebellum. So this patient had a resection. Um, and again, just showing this more just to show that metastasis is really the top of the differential. So for adults, the second most common lesion is a hemangioblastoma. This is actually a low-grade lesion. Uh, they come in kind of two different flavors. The more common one is this one, where there's a, a very bright nodule, um, which is your vascular lesion, and it, it produces a cyst fluid. And you know, with surgery, this can be a cure for the patient if, if this mural nodule is removed. Um, really, you do not have to go after the walls of the cyst. Once the nodule is removed, the cyst fluid doesn't get produced, and you could really help a patient with this one. This is a more solid um, appearing one. So this one is cystic less common is a solid appearing hemangioblastoma. These can be very difficult to take out surgically. They're almost like an ABM. They're very highly vascular. In this patient, we got an angiogram and ended up embolizing uh, about a third of this lesion. And again, very similar presentation of hydrocephalus and incoordination. So things like finger to nose um, was off. So in children, a completely different differential. Some of the most common ones are JPA, so juvenile pilocytic astrocytoma, shown here. Similar to hemangioblastoma, it has a mural nodule and then a cystic component to it. Uh, very common is medulloblastoma. This arises from the roof of the fourth ventricle. Um, and then ependymoma. Some people call these plastic tumors in that they actually take up this, the shape of the ventricle and sometimes will go out those foramina that we discussed early on, foramina of uh, Luchka, for instance and could involve some of the lower cranial nerves. So again, a set, you know, something I think it's useful to know for uh, differentials when dealing with tumors in different locations. Here's another uh, location. This is a tumor in the brainstem. Now in the past, these were called DIPGs. So diffuse infiltrating pontiglioma. Some of the WHO criteria has changed and usually these are called diffuse midline gliomas. They usually have a characteristic um, histone mutation. Unfortunately, these tumors are, are somewhat difficult to treat. You know, these tumors are, are usually lower grade, but they intermingle with many of the normal um, 
neurons in, in the brain stem, such that if you were to do a surgery, you would have really unacceptable amount of collateral damage. So these are not usually resected. More frequently though, they're biopsied. So this patient um, underwent a right frontal biopsy where we passed the needle down from the top of the head all the way down, which is um, you know, always a little bit disconcerting. But we got a good sample of tissue and based on that, we're able to identify some gene mutations to enroll her in the clinical trial. Really the, the cornerstone for this is, at this time is radiation treatment, but it's definitely an area of active research. Okay. Let me just take a quick look at some questions here. Uh, can you expand on why anterior one third of superior sagittal sinus sacrifice is preferred? So, um, you know, anytime you're sacrificing a sinus, you know, it shouldn't be done um, for, for no reason. Uh, but if you had to, um, the, the first third is a little bit safer in that a lot of the major bridging veins are found more posteriorly, especially in the middle and posterior portions. You can actually see how you know, even in this picture we, we happen to be looking at, it's, it's much more diminutive in, in the anterior part, not as many large veins, and as you get further back in the larges. So I think part of it is um, just a natural anatomy, the way the bridging veins come in, and um, a little bit less eloquent area in the front here. So again, you know, you never want to take the sinus, you know, lightly, um, but if you ever had to, you, you could get away with it a little more in the anterior portion. So if you have a meningioma, we're really trying to go for a cure, but um, I, think, I think surveillance and radiation is a very good alternative. Okay, why is, okay, so that's, we, we answered the second question here. And then diffusion weighting imaging is helpful to differentiate which ring enhancing lesions. Um, I would say lymphoma, infection, GBM, these are all things that actually will, could be ring enhancing and, and then could diffusion restrict. So, um, you know, even though you have an extra sequence, still not the most um, specific. The metastatic melanoma, could that be confused with an oligodendroglioma due to hemorrhage and calcification? Um, yeah, I think so. That's a good point. Um, and that oligos are usually um, kind of the gray-white interface. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that's... Um, you know, with surgery, you'll be able to get um, tissue, and I think either one could probably, you know, prompt you to do surgery. So yeah, that's, that's a good point. Okay, so a few more uh, tumor cases. So this is an example of some lesions in the cellar region. So this, this kind of area in the sphenoid bone. So here we have um, some pituitary tumors. We have a, a microadenoma. You can see very nicely the uh, pituitary stalk in the midline here and then macroadenoma, which we see in a coronal and sagittal view. So really, I think it's worth just briefly discussing some of the indications for surgery for pituitary tumors. Really, in my mind, I counsel patients that there are two reasons to do surgery for pituitary gland tumors. One is if the tumor is secretory, meaning if it will secrete different hormones. Um, a simple blood test can, can, can look for these. Of course, prolactin is one that you wanna check uh, right off the bat because that's something that can be treated with, with medicine rather than surgery. And some of the other uh, common hormones um, that you do a full, full panel on. So if those hormones are elevated, that could have deleterious effects on the body such that surgery um, could potentially cure the patient if you get all the adenoma out. Second thing, which applies a little bit more to macroadenomas, which are just defined as, as larger pituitary tumors, uh, if it's pushing on the optic chiasm or the optic apparatus. So you can only almost make out here a little bit the left-sided optic chiasm, but this tumor is definitely touching it and it seems to be compressing the right side. This is a patient who had, right, who had visual field deficits and was offered surgery for that reason. So really two reasons. One, if it's a secreting tumor that could lead to endocrine dysfunction where there's too much of a certain hormone or, and or if it's pushing on the optic nerve, causing vision decline. And of course, you want to have the patient see my ophthalmologist to do an objective test of them. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.